Good afternoon. I think they can hear that. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the B. Thomas Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences Dean's Lecture Series. I'm Ann Hakey, and I'm the Interim Dean of the Golisano College. The Dean's Lecture Series is design designed to bring esteemed individuals from academia, industry, and government to RIT to share their experiences and their wisdom with our students, our faculty, and the community at large. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge our professional interpreters, Dale Moore, and Amberly Jones, and thank you very much for providing this very important service. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Vint Cerf. Vint is Vice President and Chief Internet, Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, but he's probably best known as one of the fathers of the Internet for his work in designing TCP IP protocols and the architecture of the Internet. Vint is a recipient of the Turing Award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and 24 honorary degrees, among many, many other career accolades. Too many to mention today. Today, Vint will present Digital Vellum, Preserving Digital Content for the Ages. He'll discuss the preservation methods that we will need with the increasing quantity of information that is born digital. And thus, it will be dependent on the operation of aging applications and systems to properly render in the future. Following the talk, there'll be a brief question and answer period, and we'd ask people to come down to the microphones that are here in the aisles. Okay. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Vint to the podium. Vint. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I hope that uh, there's some food after this so you have a, an excuse for coming here. It's called Theorem Number 208. If you feed them, they'll come, right? So uh, here we are. I really appreciate the opportunity to return to Rochester. I've been here a few times before, uh, but not on this particular topic. I've got microphones going theory here. It's turned on. It's, and it was turned on before, so uh, I have to rely on the guys back in the sound booth. Are we better now? Okay. Can you all hear me back there in the rear? No, no, you're supposed to say we ain't built that way. That's okay. All right. Thank you. Much better. All right. So anyway, I'm glad to be back here. On this topic, however, I've not had a chance to address this group. So. Uh, my uh, big concern has to do with the preservation of digital information. Let me start out by reminding you that static content has been uh, archived and preserved for literally uh, centuries and in some cases millennia. Things like uh, tablets that were written uh, in cuneiform uh, were around 4,000 years ago or more. Some of these tablets were not intended to be preserved as long as they have been, but the, they were clay tablets and there were fires and the fires baked the clay and the result was a very resilient kind of uh, technology. Papyrus uh, has also been around for a long time. It's not necessarily a long live medium. On the other hand, uh, it does turn out that in very dry climates, uh, some papyrus has lasted for literally thousands of years buried in the sands uh, in Egypt, for instance. Uh, vellum, on the other hand, these are animal hides, could be sheepskin or goatskin, uh, actually has extraordinarily long live properties. Some of these manuscripts have lasted for a thousand years or even more. Uh, they, uh, in many cases, are as beautiful as the day that they were uh, originally inscribed. Some of them have been uh, illustrated uh, with uh, you know, beautiful colors, gold, and things like that. Uh, so we have an experience with archiving static content, but along comes the digital age, and now we have other content, which I will con uh, continue to suggest is static. For example, YouTube and Flickr, Picasso, these are photographs or movies, and movies are static in the sense that the Content is really a series of fixed still images. It's just that we see them. 
as movies because of the way they're projected. Uh, so there are reasons to want to store and retain digital information for long periods of time. Um, in the case of scientific data, this is another kind of static information, uh, and conventional publications and the like, we want to hang on to this information for future use. In some cases, um, we need to hang on to metadata about the data. So if you have a bunch of numbers, it's important to know that they're temperature or they are pressure or they are some other metric. If we don't remember that, uh, the numbers are not too useful. We may need to know the calibration of the instruments that collected the data so we know how to correctly interpret it. And we might even want to preserve software that was used to analyze the data, possibly because we'll get new data and we want to compare the analysis with the older data. Or we may have new analytical tools and we want to compare the new analysis with the older data as well as the new data. Now the applications that we run against these uh, data typically run in an operating system environment. And it may be necessary to preserve the operating system in order to run the application that knows how to correctly interpret the data. And then there's the question of what hardware the operating system ran on. And there can be situations where an operating system doesn't run on any current hardware that's available, let's say, 100 years from now. And so we may need to retain the detailed description of the hardware that the operating system ran on so we can run the old application to correctly interpret the data. In the long term, if we're going to preserve this kind of information, we have to have a business model that pays for the cost of preservation. And so we can't simply pat ourselves on the back because we have a piece of hardware uh, or a medium that we think will preserve the information. It's going to cost some money to do that. And if we don't have a business model that supports the cost, then the data may not be retained. So there's this continuing need, or will be a continuing need, for you know, curating the data, cataloging it. You need to be able to search the data, search the publications. Uh, the technical uh, material, uh, measured data, and everything else, we need to be able to find it. I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, you're a 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodman. Some of you will remember that she was the author of a book called The Team of Rivals, which was about Abraham Lincoln's cabinet. He basically hired the people that competed with him for the presidency. And what was interesting about this book is that the author reproduces the conversations of the time. Now, of course, I wasn't there, so I'm not able to confirm that the conversations are precisely correct. On the other hand, it seemed very uh, plausible to me. And the reason that the conversations were so plausible is that she went to, I don't know really how many, but certainly it could have been 100 libraries, to get the correspondence exchanged by the principals who were uh, in the uh, White House or in, the, uh, in Washington or in the country anyway at the time. And so she saw not only what they were talking about, but what positions they took and what views they expressed. And in consequence, created a very credible dialogue as if she had been a fly on the wall. So now imagine you're the 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin, and you decide to write about the 21st, I'm sorry, about the 20th century and the 21st century. Well, where's all the email? Where did all the tweets go? What about all the Facebook pictures and the announcements and everything else? Will they be around? in 2100, and it's not at all clear. And even if the bits are preserved, what about the software that rendered the bits for us? It's not clear whether that software will still be executable at that point. So we may be a black hole, a black information hole, in the 22nd century, unless we do something about this, because so much of our correspondence and our interactions are now in electronic form. And it's slightly ironic that we keep thinking that we digitized everything and that means it's preservable. And yet what we may have done is make it less 
likely to be around 100 years from now than it was in its original hard copy form, for example. Now, look, we've got all these media that we've invented over the years to preserve digital information. There is one thing missing from this picture. There are no readers for the five and a quarter inch floppies or the eight inch floppies or the three and a half inch floppies or the CD-ROMs and the DVDs and so on, the VHS tapes. I have hundreds of VHS tapes in my house and I have one VHS reader that's still working uh, and a DVD on the other side that I can probably trans transfer stuff to. Uh, or we may just get you know, external drives that we store away. But the problem with these is that the readers might not be available, or in the case of the external drive, there's almost certainly some damn connector that doesn't work anymore with a machine that's 10 or 15 years later. Uh, you know, and, the, and the equipment makers seem to be cavalier about inventing new interfaces and new connectors that don't have adapters for the old stuff. There are even, you know, really large-scale storage systems. This is an image of one of the inside of a Google data center. So now we've been talking about um, sort of the static uh, materials that we all produce, whether it's spreadsheets or, uh, uh, or documents or, or uh, other images and things like that. Although you do know that in order to make use of a spreadsheet, uh, even though it's kind of a static object that gets interpreted, you need it to interact uh, to be useful, so you need a piece of software that will, in fact, run uh, the spreadsheet so you can put new data in for purposes of uh, trying out new ideas. Well, there are all these things, that, uh, services that you and I use all the time, and they generate large quantities of digital information. And it's an open question whether 100 years from now or even 10 years from now, we will be able to uh, recapture and see that information. I have one example, personal experience, uh, just a few weeks ago. I was uh, rummaging around in my photographs, physical photographs, uh, and I found a CD-ROM which was labeled Vint Cerf Archive 1. And I took the CD-ROM, wondering what was on it, over to a somewhat older uh, Macintosh which had a CD reader in it and I put the uh, CD-ROM in the reader, and it said, this disk is empty, would you like me to reformat it? And I remember thinking, why would I write Vintsurf Archive on this thing if it was empty? So I took it out of the Macintosh uh, CD-ROM reader, and I took it over to an even older IBM ThinkPad that was running Microsoft XP on it. And lo and behold, there were lots of photographs and lots of other documents on the disk drive. So I had the wrong reader for that. And if I hadn't kept the old ThinkPad, it's not clear what would happen to the content of that CD-ROM. So I submit to you that we're having this problem every single day. You may not have noticed it yet if you haven't gone back and found something that, you know, I wonder what's on this three and a half inch floppy oh, where am I going to find a reader for the three-and-a-half-inch floppy? Have you stopped by the Smithsonian recently? So uh, we are facing uh, a really serious problem, and it's going to get worse. For example, we have this Internet of Things upon us, and these are just a few examples of the things that, uh, that we find day-to-day uh, in, -day now, in, you know, Internet-enabled picture frames and refrigerators and telephones that look like telephones, but they're voice over IP boxes. And the guy in the middle here uh, is, um, he's got an internet-enabled surfboard. Uh, I haven't met him, but I, you know, I imagine he's sitting on the water waiting for the next wave thinking, you know, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. <laughs> so uh, he built a laptop into the surfboard and put a Wi-Fi service at the rescue shack, and now he's selling this as a product. So if you wanted to be out on the water surfing the internet, that's your product. Uh, there are other devices that are coming, as you all know, things like Fitbits and Google Glass and uh, just an endless array of new appliances that will be generating bits, some of which we will care about. Uh, I have an example in, in my house. I have a, um, a radio base. It's an IBV, IPv6 radio network which has small devices that are sampling temperature, humidity, and light levels in every room in the house every five minutes. 
this self-defining, self-organizing network then transmits the data to a server down in the basement, and I accumulate that information over the course of a year. Now, I know only a geek would do that, but the honest fact is at the end of the year, I have very good quality engineering data about how well uh, my heating and ventilation and air conditioning system has worked so we can adjust it uh, as needed. Uh, one room is the wine cellar. And it's very important to keep that below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that room is alarmed. Uh, so if there is a, a temperature rise to over 60 degrees, I get an SMS on my mobile you know, saying, your wine is warming up. That's happened more than once. And uh, when there's nobody at home to reset the cooling system, so I called the people that made the monitoring system. Uh, they were a company called Arch Rock, which was acquired by Cisco a few years ago. And I said, do you have remote actuators? And they said, yes. Uh, and I said, do you have strong authentication associated with it? Because I don't want the 15-year-old next door messing around with my uh, cooling system on the wine cellar. And they said, yes. So we installed the remote actuator. And then I got to thinking, you know, I could actually tell if somebody's gotten into the wine cellar when I'm away, because I could see that the lights were turned off and on. Uh, but I don't know what they did in there. So I thought some more about that and concluded that what I needed to do uh, is to put RFID tags on each bottle <laughs> and then install an RFID detector, which I have now acquired, and I can do instantaneous inventory to see if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. <laughs> and I was boasting of this design to one of my engineering friends who announced that I had a bug in the design. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. So now we have to put sensors in the cork. <laughs> and as long as we're going to do that, we might as well sample the esters that are in the wine to try to figure out if it's ready to drink. So the obvious thing to do is to interrogate the cork before you open the bottle. And then if that's the bottle that got up to 75 or 80 degrees, uh, that's the one you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. I do submit to you, however, that this kind of sensor network is going to be very common everywhere. We will have it in our residences, we'll have it in uh, office buildings like this one, we'll have it in our cars, and we may even have sensors on our person. Some of you may already be wearing Fitbit, for example, and other kinds of things, maybe medical devices. So we will be surrounded by a, a continuing flow of digital information, some of which it will be valuable to us to retain over time. And it gets even worse because if we think about executable content, think about the kinds of applications that require software to run for you to enjoy the application or to make use of the application, as in the case of a spreadsheet. So what do we do about all that? Well, you can think about examples, and I've given a few here, uh, and you can tell that these examples illustrate the fact that if you don't have the application software available to you at the time you're interested in this digital object, that the digital object may not be in any way useful to you. It's funny in a way that you know we have a computer museum. There are several of them. There's one out in California called the Computer History Museum, and it has lots of hardware in it. But we don't necessarily have places for software museums, although the Computer History Museum is now accumulating software. The Internet Archive, it's run by uh, Brewster Kale out in uh, the, what, the uh, Silicon Valley, is also accumulating software. But there's a project at Carnegie Mellon called Olive. It's run by uh, Mahadev Satyanarayanan. We call him Satya for obvious reasons. Uh, and he has done something pretty dramatic. What he has done is found a way to preserve operating systems and applications from older equipment and emulate an environment that allows them to run. Now, this is a non-trivial exercise. The first problem is that we have to correctly interpret what the bits mean, and that means we have to have the application that knows how to interpret those bits and to render them or properly treat them. Now, there may be some problems here. Imagine for a moment that the application software that you use to create some object, whether it's an image, a game, a document, a spreadsheet, that that, that software uh, was developed by a company that has gone bankrupt. 
or it has decided it's not going to support that version of the application anymore, or it decides it's not going to support that operating system anymore, or it's not going to support the hardware anymore. And it, maybe it isn't just bankruptcy, but it might just be a, an ordinary business decision not to continue to support some particular piece of hardware or software. Where does that leave you? Where does that leave us if we had created a lot of material we care about and it was dependent on having that application, that operating system, and that particular piece of hardware to run? So there aren't any rules right now that say people have to preserve any of these things on our behalf. It gets even more complicated. Uh, suppose that uh, a company says, well, I'm not going to support this anymore. And you say, well, can I have the source code? And they'll say, no, because half of that source code went into the new version, and so we're not interested in having you have access to that. Uh, or you say, well, can I have the, you know, the object code, and could I run it in the cloud, and could other people use it? And they'll say, no, we want people to pay us if they're you know, running our object code. And so you find yourself trapped, potentially, with an inability to continue to make use of that software. Uh, so the issue for us has to do with not only the uh, technical ability to run old software, but the legal ability to get access to it in the first place. So we have questions about what the legal frameworks are that may be needed in order to um, preserve our ability to run old software. Uh, one thing which I find really interesting is that in the case of copyright, during the period after Xerox and others developed a dry copying system, we think of it as Xerox machines, uh, the publishing industry got very worried that they would publish one book, they'd sell one copy, and then everybody would simply duplicate it with the copying machines. And so they raised a big issue about people's ability to do that and said there should be laws against it. The library community, on the other hand, argued strongly that there should be some fair use of copying machines for personal use, for educational use, for satirical use. And so they got uh, exceptions put into the Copyright Act that said, for purposes of fair use, you were allowed to make duplication of some of these published works, even if they were still under copyright. What we don't have right now is the concept of preservation right. And I think that there needs to be some serious consideration of how the Copyright Act or the Patent Acts can be, could accommodate a right that would permit you to run software or even hardware, possibly in an emulated environment for third parties without violating the law or violating patent licensing uh, rules and things of that kind. So we have some work ahead of us on the legal side as well as on the technical side. And by the way, we also have work ahead of us on the business model side because in order to uh, achieve this kind of an outcome where we can run old software in the cloud, for example, we have to have some way of uh, paying for all that because it's not a zero cost uh, service. And obviously over time, more and more stuff will be accumulated in digital form, so we have to have increasingly large capacity for storing things away. So the Olive Project, uh, which I alluded to earlier, uh, was originally sponsored by the National Science Foundation, which has now uh, completed its, uh, its run. There's still work to be done, uh, but uh, at the moment I don't think it has further support. I hope to help find, find some. Uh, so this is what they were doing. They were going to build emulators of hardware that would allow them to run the old operating systems literally bit for bit, and then load the application software in the operating system environment on the emulated hardware and essentially run the way it ran on the old equipment. This is harder than it looks. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts in, in an emulation like this. And one of them is to get the exact behavior of the hardware, including any bugs that there were in the hardware, because the operating system and the applications might have worked only because they were, it relied on precise behaviors of the operating or the uh, of the hardware. And so you have to get that specification exactly right and the uh, implementation of it exactly right. And the idea basically is to load in the operating system, 
any libraries that need to be dynamically linked in, whatever configuration is needed uh, in order to get the system into exactly the state that it would have been in if you were running on the real hardware in the past. Uh, so uh, I tried to explain this to some people who are less uh, aware than you are about the technical side of this. Uh, and uh, I said, well, it's kind of like taking a digital x-ray of the machine when it's actually running this particular application, because you could see the bits for the operating system, see the bits for the application, see the bits for the file that's being interpreted, and uh, also see the hardware and its description. Now, of course, you don't really take a digital x-ray, but it seemed like a reasonable metaphor. Uh, it was not an easy thing to do, but Mahadev and his team succeeded in doing this for at least something like a dozen different hardware and software platforms. So then he uh, ran into the next big problem, which had to do with how he could do this uh, in an environment where the amount of information you needed was pretty substantial to do the emulation. You needed all the hardware descriptors and so on. And he was also trying to figure out how to do this so that he could run this not just in a machine adjacent to you, but also run it in the cloud somewhere. And I'll come back to the, the cloud bit just a little bit, because in order to make this work in a cloud environment, you have to keep feeding exactly the right information to the uh, machine that's running on, on the client side. So you're actually running the application in the cloud, but you're getting the moral equivalent of the screenshots coming at the right time. It's, it's harder than doing streaming video. In streaming video, you're, you know that you're just going to get a sequential series of bits that are going to be interpreted and displayed or, or uh, made audible. And you know that they're supposed to come in a particular order. But when you're executing code, you could have, just like everyone else should have studied things like working sets, you know that you can bounce around in the virtual memory space while you're executing code and you somehow have to do this in a way that allows the right data to come from the cloud at the right time in order to have a smooth and continued uh, emulation. These virtual machines turn out to be really big. And so figuring out which piece of the virtual machine should come in now or ahead of time or pre-schedule it is a non-trivial exercise. But that's what his team managed to, fi uh, to figure out how to do. Uh, so they were very uh, careful about looking for reference patterns to figure out what they should preload. Uh, they, they do a kind of demand paging through the network uh, in order to make this function properly, and they prefetch things that they uh, believe uh, will be needed uh, ahead of time. So if you look at the client side, basically it's running a virtual machine on top of a kernel, which is running on the actual raw hardware. And so the virtual machine environment is derived from that hardware and he reads in the old operating system bit for bit, then he loads in the application, then he loads in the file or whatever else is being interpreted, and he runs that ensemble. And he can do that either in a machine that's right there on your desk, and everything is local, or he can do it by running it from the cloud. So the image that he stores away that allows you to do this has several pieces. Uh, an example uh, of this is, uh, sorry, is uh, the, there's, he runs this as XML, basically. It's a very interesting way of making the whole thing look like it's really a web application. So the thing that he has tied away uh, is enough to pull in the machine description, then the operating system, then the application. And in fact, if you look at his implementation, uh, Locally, uh, what you see is up here, uh, what you see is the uh, KVM, the virtual machine, which is running the emulation of the hardware. Uh, and in that virtual machine is running Microsoft Windows, for example, and an application. And the client is now just asking for pages to come from the web server using ordinary HTTP. So as far as the rest of the network is concerned, this just looks like another web page, uh, web-based application. 
And the end result is that he's capable of running this stuff in the cloud. And he demonstrated this at a uh, conference in Stanford earlier this year. It was the, um, what's it called? The Internet Information Preservation Consortium. There are about 200 people who were interested in figuring out how to achieve this objective. So there are people who care about this who are already trying to work on the problem. Uh, but it's still not an entirely solved problem. There are a whole bunch of technical challenges that, uh, that still remain, and these are some of the things that uh, Sacha has described, some of them being just scaling and performance. Um, the virtual machines just kept getting, getting bigger and bigger and more complicated, and the networks never run fast enough, although he did notice something very interesting when he was running emulations of older machines that sometimes they ran faster than they used to run on the older machine, which means the timing is all messed up. And so if you were doing a video game, it was actually harder to run the video game in the new emulation environment because it went faster than it was supposed to. And so now you have to artificially uh, uh, you know, adapt the emulation to slow down to make it run like a crappy old PC back in the 1980s. And that included, by the way, he was able to reproduce not only the, you know, the, the, the speeds, but also the crappy uh, graphics also were you know, correctly reproduced, so you could see how bad the graphics used to look 20 years ago. Um, another thing which is, was really tough is getting the, uh, the emulation of the hardware exactly right. And sometimes he discovered that the descriptions of the hardware weren't correct. I mean, the documentation was not accurate. If he tried to run the machine based on the documentation, it didn't behave right, and he had to go back to find out well, what were the other weird little things about these uh, particular hardware instances that he had to get right to make it work. Uh, I think another thing that he was pretty excited about uh, was that he wanted to be able to run this on more than one kind of virtual machine because, as you know, the cloud-based systems are offering a variety of different virtual machine environments. Ideally, it would be the case that you could set this, this kind of capacity up so it would run on any of the cloud environments that are currently available or might be available in the future. Those of you who are setting these kinds of things will know about the notion of containers, for example, uh, which is intended to be a way of isolating a piece of software that's running in a cloud environment. I think that these ideas and the container ideas and the things that allow you to move things from one cloud to another may be at least uh, part of the solution uh, to the problem of achieving long-term ability to run this stuff. So it won't matter which cloud you're running in or which other environment you're running in, but we'd have to think consciously about designing something that has its own long live capacity to keep running on different clouds or something else if we go beyond the cloud computing to another alternative environment. So isolating this stuff so that it runs on almost anything is, uh, is pretty important. It's probably worth mentioning a few other projects that uh, I alluded to. One of them is the uh, Internet Archive. Brewster Kale uh, was the guy that wired one of the first connection machines uh, that Danny Hillis designed at MIT a long time ago and got very interested in the early 1990s in the possibility of preserving the World Wide Web. Uh, this is sort of the step beyond where Larry Page and Sergey Brin were. All they wanted to do was download the current World Wide Web and index the thing. That seemed fairly ambitious all by itself. Brewster wanted to save the entire World Wide Web as it was continuing to evolve. Now, of course, he doesn't have enough memory to do all of that, but he's been essentially uh, pulling information out of the World Wide Web, and he has his Wayback Machine, which lets you set a date or a time or a year or a month and look at what the World Wide Web looked like then. And it's actually a pretty amazing thing to be able to steer back in time and see how primitive some of the stuff was that we were all excited about 20 years ago. Uh, and now it's sort of ho-hum. Uh, he has backup capability. Um, he's got the Library of Alexandria, not the one in Virginia, it's the Library of Alexandria in Egypt is his backup site, and there's something iconically wonderful about that. All of you will remember that the first two instances of the Library of Alexandria burned down. Uh, and it wasn't on purpose, apparently. At one point, it was Caesar screwing everything up in the, in the, in the bay uh, near Alexandria and, and lighting ships on fire, and the fire leapt over onto the shore and burned down the library. Um, 
anyway, he is now, uh, he, he being the, the director of the Library of Alexandria, uh, is now the backup for that. And I think that there is another backup in Asia, but I've forgotten where. Uh, Brewster told me that they are now preserving not only uh, the contents of the World Wide Web, but they're also pulling in scanned <laughs> books, digitized books, and also software. The Computer History Museum is doing similar kinds of things. And Google, of course, is scanning books uh, with the purpose of making their digital images available to people. And there's a, an organization uh, that Google sponsors in Paris called the Cultural Institute, which is helping uh, museums take digital images of their holdings and make them available online. And you can build a virtual museum, for example, by taking images from the same artist, for example, and having a virtual museum of Van Gogh, for instance. Now, all of that, of course, looks very wonderful because all that, Im all those digitized images are readily available. You can you know, assemble them into a web page, and it's all really wonderful. The problem is, what happens when those images are no longer correctly interpretable? I don't know about you, but I have a lot of uh, digitized photographs, and every once in a while, when I go back looking for something with a newer version of software, I find a big black square, and it says, I don't know how to interpret this format which means that those of us who believe that we were preserving our images for the long term may actually have failed to do so. And so people have asked me what to do about preserving at least the digital images, and I've told them, get some good quality photographic paper and print them out. Uh, you know, that made a number of uh, photographic paper companies really happy when they heard that. But to be really honest with you, uh, photographs some of them have lasted 150 years or more. And there are no digital media with which we have had any experience that have lasted for 150 years because digital media haven't been around that long. So uh, it may, I don't have the you know, great news for you right now. I think the, the news is we need to solve some of the problems I've described to design and build these archival uh, systems to run old software, but we may also be sm have to be smart about alternative media for storing stuff that we would otherwise have left solely in digital form. So I'm, I think I would like to stop there with the challenge that some of you who are looking for dissertation research work might find uh, some useful ideas from this, this particular set of problems. There are business problems. We would have to figure out uh, how to make this work over the long term. Uh, and there are legal problems that people will have to sort through in order to create a legal framework in which we can preserve digital content for long periods of time. And so what I'd like to do now is uh, to go into a kind of Q&A mode, which does not have to be confined to this topic. I'm happy to respond to other questions which you might have about, for example, the internet and where it's going. Uh, but at this point, I just want to say thank you for letting me take time this afternoon, and let's have a chat. So in theory, there are two microphones here, and I promise I won't spit if there's anybody who wants to ask a question or raise an issue. So it doesn't have to be a question. On your mark, get set, go. You're it. Hi. Hi. Not really relevant to the talk, but this how is, do you... This is weird. You have to talk into the microphone. You yeah. want to look at me, and it's weird. Yeah. So I don't know if I stand down like this. How's that? How do you feel about the use of AI in the future of the Internet? Okay, so uh, this is a really interesting question, and let's, ex let's expand the question. What about just the use of AI, period, not just the Internet? So, as some of you have been reading uh, scary comments from people we respect, like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, that you know the the, the uh, monster robots are coming and we should all be terrified. Uh, I don't subscribe to that. I think that artificial intelligence will be more likely uh, an adjunct, something that we use to assist us. Whenever you do a Google search, you're actually exercising quite a bit of artificial intelligence, even if you don't notice that. Uh, when you're using a mobile phone uh, and it is 
responding to a voice command, you're using some things that we call artificial intelligence. But some of you will know that the history of artificial intelligence is kind of peculiar. If it doesn't work, it's artificial intelligence. When it works, it's engineering. <laughs> so, so artificial intelligence is not permitted to ever get anywhere successfully because by the time it does anything that works, it ha it's not artificial intelligence anymore. Uh, now, there are some things that I worry about, but it has less to do with artificial intelligence than it has to do with buggy software. Now, I talked to a few of you earlier today, and so I will rant a bit more on buggy software if you don't mind. Uh, at Google, we have massage machines, uh, chairs, and my wife loves them. We have one in our house. I refuse to sit in it. And the reason is that I know it's run on software, and I'm, I'm afraid it's going to fold up like this while I'm in it <laughs> with, because of some software bug. So apart from this digital preservation thing, we have collectively a huge challenge ahead of us, and that's to try to reduce the mistakes that we make when we write software, because those mistakes could become fatal, especially if these are devices like self-driving cars, which Google has an interest in. And Elon Musk just announced that the Tesla version 7 will do some self-driving for you out on the road. So we need to think really hard about how to make our programming environments help us not make mistakes. But I have another piece of bad news for you, and I've gotten in, into some fairly uh, heated debate with my colleagues uh, who are members of the Association for Computer Machinery about liability for bad code. We've gotten away with murder, folks, as programmers. We've all said, well, you know, programming is hard and it's complicated and there are bugs and, you know, don't look at me. I don't think we're going to be able to get away with that for very much longer. We are collectively becoming so dependent on software that uh, it does things potentially to us or for us uh, that could be harmful. And I think when you get into a situation like that, you have to start showing responsibility and accountability and, by the way, maybe even liability. So if you're thinking about going into the programming business, just keep in mind that that may be a pressure that builds over time. So I don't know, are you going to change your major now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what I plan on doing. <laughs> so uh, last comment on coming back now to your original point on artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm seeing uh, more and more opportunity to make use of things that we call artificial intelligence. Sometimes we call it machine learning uh, at Google. And it's amazing how powerful those technologies can be. But I want you to take away one other point, and that has to do with the robotics business. A lot of people think of robots as these, you know, things that are humaniform and are scary, or things that look like big dogs. Have you seen the Boston Dynamics big dog? And, you know, it's kind of a scary-looking mechanical thing that runs up the hill. Um, I, I want you to imagine for a moment that that's not the only kind of robot there could be. Most people think of robots as a physical thing. But there are other things that we could call robots. For example, a trading program on the stock exchange is a robot from my point of view. It takes in real world input, it processes the input, and it has a real world effect. Of course, it's today, especially program trading, is like little kids playing soccer, right? All the programs have the same base. If the stock market goes down, they all sell. When the stock market goes up, they all buy, like the kids chasing the ball instead of somebody standing over here guarding the goal. So we've got a serious problem on our hands when we have software that has a very direct impact on our finances, on our you know, well-being. So I think I am worried about robotics, not just in the physical sense, but in the logical sense. And that's another place where we will have to feel a lot more Thank you for the question. Yes, good Thank question. You. Any more? And over here? Are, are you, you're not asking. Oh, you're, you're trading. <laughs> That's right. You're assigning. Okay. Well, here's one. It's okay to use this microphone, too, by the way. Okay. What's your question? So it's a two part question. Can I take this off? Or? Tech group now. I'll, I'll leave yeah, you it. Can pull it off. Okay. Sorry. 
There you go. Okay. <laughs> you do it. If you do it, that's okay. How many engineers does it take to pull a microphone? Right. Just, just one. Um, so first part of the question, are you the most dressed up employee at Google? <laughs> Probably. Uh, the, the head of sales, um, uh, who has gone on to do some other things, was known to wear uh, a tie and a suit most of the time because he was dealing with companies that were um, paying us for advertising. There is a story behind this. I don't know if you want to know the story. Why would I wear a three-piece suit? So um, when I was in high school, I didn't want to look like everybody else. So I always wore a, a tie, a sports coat, and slacks, and I carried a briefcase. I guarantee you, nobody else in my high school did that. <laughs> then um, I got to, uh, to college, and I was a little more relaxed. I was at Stanford as an undergraduate. Uh, then um, after I finished my PhD at UCLA, I went back to teach at Stanford. And I thought it was respectful of the students to be properly dressed, so I usually wore uh, at least a sports coat and tie and slacks or maybe a suit. But then uh, I was asked by the Defense Department to move to Washington to run the internet research program for DARPA. And my wife said, Washington, D.C., three-piece suits. And so she went off and bought three three-piece suits from uh, Saks Fifth Avenue at Stanford Shopping Center. So we arrive in Washington in the middle of the summer. And one of those suits was a seersucker outfit, you know, lightweight for the hot, uh, humid Washington, D.C. So uh, not too long after I uh, joined DARPA, I was asked to come to the Congress to make a uh, testimony about some of the projects that I was engaged in. And so I wore my three-piece seersucker suit. And I went in, and I did my thing, and I came back, and a few weeks went by, and then the director of DARPA said, I need to see you about your testimony. And I thought, uh-oh, there goes my government career. So I showed up, and the director said, he had a letter in front of him, and he said, uh, the, the chairman thanks you very much for, uh, for coming over to testify. By the way, he said, you're the best dressed DARPA guy they'd ever seen. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? That's positive feedback. I'm going to wear three-piece suits from now on, and now here's, that's what you get. That's the answer. Okay, you got another question. I think. Yeah, I thought it might have had something to do with the three-way handshake, but I guess not. <laughs> um, next question is, uh, do you see anything akin to TCPIP taking off kind of like the internet and all that stuff. Do you see any new technology on the horizon that might explode in a similar way? So uh, it's hard to tell. Google has done something called QUIC, Q-U-I-C. Uh, and there's some working groups at IETF that are looking at that. It's a more compressed form uh, using UDP instead of TCP. And it includes crypto. So if that's not so much taking off in the same sense as, as I think it's a improve, potential improvement in terms of speed and latency and everything else. But that's not the kind of transformation that you're really thinking about. The real transformations I think, will come in two ways. One is this Internet of Things. It's chaos right now, lots of different protocols, no interoperability, uh, worries about accuracy and safety and privacy and everything else. That'll all get sorted out eventually, I think. So we will see Mark Weiser's uh, vision that the network and computing just disappears into the landscape. People won't be thinking about that's a computer. It's just an appliance. And the fact that it has software in it and is connected to the net is mostly invisible. So that transformation will happen. But the other one, the most important one, I think, is going to be neural interfaces. And I'm not thinking about, you know, mind reading stuff by sticking something on your, on your head. I'm thinking more about direct interface to our neural system. Right now, we have a very good understanding of our sensory system, our sensory motor system, and we know what the signaling is. We know what it looks like. We know how the body either interprets incoming signals or generates outgoing motor control signals. My wife has two cochlear implants, and they work incredibly well. Her first one was in 1996, which is over 20 years, almost 20 years ago. And this is a dramatic thing, so I want to give you a little short story about what this was like. She was deaf for 50 years. She lost her hearing when she was three. This is important. She had, had gained her speech, you know, by the time she was three, she was speaking. And then she had spinal meningitis and wiped out all the little ciliar hairs inside the cochlea. So she was profoundly deaf. And she stayed that way. She was a, an accomplished lip reader. When we moved to Washington, I thought she worked for CIA, but couldn't tell me. Uh, and then she got this cochlear implant. And I was away at the time. 
this is an outcome, uh, um, sorry, it's an outpatient operation. It takes about 45 minutes to do it. You go home for a couple of weeks, everything uh, you know, heals. Then you go back to be activated, which sounds vaguely religious, but uh, they, basically what they do is turn on a speech processor. This thing takes in sound, does a Fourier transform to figure out what frequencies are present and in what amplitudes, figures out which of 16 or 22 electrodes to stimulate inside the cochlea, and the brain interprets that as sound. So this means we understand how to make the brain think it's hearing, even with the normal apparatus doesn't work. So by the time I got home, I discovered I had a 53-year-old teenager at home. I couldn't get her off the phone. Uh, she would take any incoming you know, advertising calls. You know, AT&T would call and say, do you want to switch? And she'd chat for, you know, oh, you're in India. Where are you? you know, <laughs> half an hour later, they say, do you want to switch to AT&T? No, my husband's is an executive at MCI. We'll stick with them, but thanks for calling. <laughs> so then she called the library. Now, actually, the reason I'm telling you this is twofold. One of them is it's amazing what this technology can do and what it's going to do in the future. But the other one is the rehabilitation side. You have to be damn determined to make use of these technologies. So she was determined that no decibel would go undetected. So she called the library and she said, um, could I sign up for recorded books for the blind? Because she wanted to hear words pronounced that she hadn't heard. And they said, fine, you know, what's your name and address and phone number? Remember, she's on the phone, right? Then they said, uh, now you're blind, aren't you? And she said, no, I'm deaf. And there was this long pause. And they're like, <laughs> how the hell is that going to work? And she listened to 500 books on tape. I mean, it was wonderful. Uh, then she went off and she got FM transceivers. So in a, a setting like this, I'd be wearing a little FM transmitter. She could sit anywhere 150 feet away and pick that up. Her favorite trick when we go to dinner is to leave the FM transmitter with its microphone on the table when she's in the ladies' room so she can listen to the conversation when she's not there. Uh, she has little microphones and patch cords to plug into the seat uh, you know, on the airplane so all she hears is the movie and not the screaming kid that's two seats away. So she's been extremely aggressive about uh, forcing herself to listen and that's an amazing thing. So we are seeing now ocular implants are coming they are not nearly as well developed as the cochlear uh, implants, but they will get there. And spinal implants for people to regain uh, the use of limbs that otherwise don't get the right motor signal. So I, you know, in, over the next couple of decades, we are going to see some very dramatic changes. And on top of all that, it doesn't have to be confined to just getting you up to normal. What's not, you know, there's nothing stopping you from programming the speech processor to pick up the same frequency range that a dog would hear. Or how about the ocular implant that lets you get to ultraviolet, infrared, who knows, x-rays. It's Superman all over again. So the idea of augmenting people's capacity uh, is not crazy anymore. So that's where I think things are headed. OK, thank you. Thank I'm, you. Let's go on over here, and then we'll switch back and forth. Do you want to take that thing out so that you don't have to? Yeah, there. Yeah, I it's can. so much easier. OK. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I was wondering about I, as I was listening to your talk was if you've been to the Strong Museum of Play, they have a very, they're working very hard on the preservation of digital games. And I know one of their biggest problems, because I've talked to them, is actually indexing them, because the Dewey Decimal System really doesn't yeah, that, work that, for that type work. of contact. It doesn't work for a lot of things, yeah. and I was wondering your yeah. thoughts on that. What to do. So Google actually uh, has that problem in a way. Think about trying to index the World Wide Web. So we don't do that. We basically build this gigantic index that's based on straight full text, right? So we associate full text with, uh, or associate terms with everything we see on the web. Now, we're getting a little better than we used to be. It started out just with text uh, words, and you typed in a series of words, and we said, OK, which pages have those words? And then we tried to rank order them. Now we're trying to recognize images, for example. And we're, I, I don't know if you're noticing this, but if you type complete questions into the Google search engine, it does a better job than it does if you just type search terms. So I asked the guy, I said, I'm, it's getting better. Well, how did you do that? And he said, well, we're starting to pay attention to word order. We're paying attention to grammar. We're paying attention to sem uh, semantics. So we have this thing called the knowledge graph. It's got about a billion nodes in it, and it links concepts to, to each other. 
in that graph. And so when you do a search, we apply to the knowledge graph to take the terms of the search and figure out what other terms we might need to look for in order to make the search more complete. So these things are starting to make this work a lot better. So I don't think indexing in the classical Dewey Decimal notion is necessary anymore. It, it might have been attractive when you had to put the books in one order. You know, I have one order you could put them in, right? Mm -hmm. And so here you have the ability to reorder everything at will. And I think it's going to make it a little easier for us to do exactly what your friends want to do. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. All right, sir. I really like that outfit. That's terrific. I Thank know. you. Um, so I was wondering, uh, in your presentation, you focus primarily on, you know, specific files that you run on specific software, and that software runs in an environment on hardware. Right. Uh, but more and more, uh, a lot of software today has gone in the direction of sort of allowing users to ignore, uh, you know, individual files or file systems. Um, uh, this is especially prevalent in mobile and in uh, cloud-based software um, affected and affected me. Uh, I mean, th in a lot of Google software, uh, most notable in my mind was the death of Google Wave, um, when now I have all of these uh, collection, they're mm -hmm. effectively collections of nodes more than individual files that for me now are just sort of kept alive on, an, on a Google App Engine instance that has just enough money put into it that they're there until there is some other software that can, you know, interpret and use this data. Um, and could e and that could easily happen if uh, any any other provider of some cloud service uh, goes down where there's just these collections of data mm -hmm. uh, that aren't really files necessarily. Right. Um, so my question, I guess, is. Uh, You've spoken a lot about how to uh, be able to keep files usable for longer, but what about, what do you think uh, companies like Google and uh, other companies like it could do to make it easier to preserve these other types of data uh, that aren't given to users as files, per se? Okay, so actually this is a very thoughtful question. I appreciate that. Uh, think about Bigtable for a moment. Uh, where you accumulate huge amounts of information of various sorts. It's all in kind of binary blob form in some cases. And the idea is that it doesn't have any particular structure. Uh, it, become, it accumulates more and more information over time. And I think in many ways uh, what you're saying, I'm interpreting what you're saying as looking at the accumulation of aggregates of, of information indexed in any number of different ways that are not distinct. It's part of an aggregate that keeps growing over time. And you raise a really interesting question because that aggregate could get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and there's no easy way of carving pieces of it off because it's not organized in the file uh, system at all. So I'm not, I don't have a really lovely you know, predetermined uh, answer to that. You triggered a very interesting question for me now to take back which is to say, what if the information that we generate is not deliberately isolated into these pieces that we can point to and say they have labels? What if they become part of a much bigger aggregate that is, that is disaggregatable not by carving off something and giving it a label, like a file name, but rather it has a constellation of characteristics that let me find it so I you know, literally extract, this is what Bigtable does, it lets you extract its contents and look at a portion of it and process that. So uh, you know what? That's a really, really good challenge. Thank you. Uh, are you working on your thesis here? <laughs> um, no. Would you like to take this one on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will take, uh, actually this is, this is uh, so far one of the most intriguing questions anybody's asked about this, so thank you. I don't have a, a wonderful answer, but I will tell you I'm going to take that back to my colleagues and say, you know what, there's another paradigm we have to pay attention to. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll switch over here. It would be fair are to you, say. Are you sure you want to be have this oh, Volkswagen thing on your shirt yeah, after yeah. after we uh, heard about the Volkswagen it's people? Just, just another shirt to me. Yeah. So. Okay. It might be fair to say that TCP/IP could outlive you. Yes. Not to. I mean, no offense by this. 
<laughs> but as somebody, well, I can tell you, IPv4 may outlive me because uh, you know we can't seem to get rid of it. We keep trying it for the last 16 years. Anyway, go ahead. As somebody interested in preserving data for future generations, that, does that move you at all? The fact that you have written something that everyone in this room relies on and that it might last longer than you? <laughs> or well, or is that so it, not something you think about? It, I sort of hope it will last longer than me. That would be nice. That's why I'm pushing IPv6, because it's got enough address space to last until after I'm dead, then it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> uh, uh, so, gee, what do you say to something like that? Um, I think, though, that we should be, we should anticipate that something will come along that's better than the internet. And I'm not unhappy about that. I think if it's better, why not? And I, I also don't think that we should be so locked into particular protocols that we can't think of something new. When we were designing uh, the interplanetary extension of the internet, we had to go away from TCP IP. Because, you know, think about it, you're trying to do flow control with TCP and you're talking to Mars, okay? It's a round trip time of 40 minutes. The flow control on TCP does not do well with a 40 minute round trip time. And also there's this other problem of planetary motion. The planets are rotating and we haven't figured out how to stop that. So, <laughs> so, if, so, you know, if you're talking to something on the surface and the planet rotates after a while, you can't talk to it unless you've got rotating satellites that are, you know, somehow linked together. So we invented a whole new suite of protocols that we call delay and disruption tolerant networking protocols, which not only are running now, on the rover on Mar rovers on Mars, the orbit, uh, orbiters, the International Space Station, of course, ground equipment here, plus the epoxy spacecraft that's in orbit around the sun. Uh, that's all in operation now. And so we have real uh, evidence and testing of the protocol suite. And it's quite different from TCP IP. And, and I'm sure that there will be some other, you know, like the quick stuff that Google is doing now, and all that will evolve into something else. And it's all okay. The idea here is to just keep going, keep inventing things that work better for everybody. And that means that there could be somebody here, maybe it's you, that will come up with the next big thing. And if you do, I'll applaud. Thanks. Okay. Oh, they disappeared. Okay. Anybody? <laughs> Did we run out of time? Okay. So I was just about to say, please join me in uh, thanking. Yeah, said they thanking already did that part. Yes, yeah, for a very anyway, thought-provoking okay. and insightful talk. I have something for you. You want to do that over here? Because sure. the microphones are here. Are you? Hell, oh, that's right. Oh, well, thank you very So thank much. you this again, and from you. everyone in Dallas Thank you very please. much. Thank you for the time you spent. Bye-bye, everybody. She wants to get on. She wants to get on. Thank you again, everyone, for coming and enjoy the rest of Brick City weekend.